They don't build them like they used to. On today's build show, we're gonna dive deep into several old houses and a few relatively new houses. Take a look at how they were built, what materials were used, what problems I found when I remodeled those, and try and answer that question, were old houses built better? Today's build show, let's get going. On the build show today, we're gonna to be answering the question, were old houses built better? You know, I've been a professional builder since 1995, but I actually grew up watching this old house and working on a remodel crew from junior high all the way through my college years before I started as a professional builder. So I've got nearly 30 years of working on old houses experience. And we're gonna jump into some really old houses and some relatively new houses today. I'm gonna to show you how they performed, how they were built, and why they lasted or maybe why they had problems. So first, let's take a look at this house right here. Let me pull up the slideshow. This is a house that my company remodeled uh, about three or four years ago we completed this. This is an 1880s house, which is pretty old for Austin, Texas. And as you can see, the house was in relatively uh, mint condition, so to speak, when we got a hold of it. Not a lot of remodel work had been done to it. Uh, here's the inside of the house, and the first thing you're going to notice, look at that really deep window jam. Two foot thick stone walls on this house. This is a solid masonry house. This is how a lot of houses around the world were built for really thousands of years. And the house was in phenomenal shape when we got it. We added an addition on the back, and here's where you can kind of see the thickness. And look at that, um, that super thick rubble wall there. I mean, this is some serious mass of the house. You also notice the house had some overhangs, but not a ton. This was maybe a one or two foot overhang on most of the house. And on the basement level, as I showed in the other photo, the, the original stone walls showed, but on the upper levels, they had been lath and plastered. This is kind of funny. The, uh, the guys later, when they added wallpaper, did some uh, graffiti to the walls. But again, you can see that super thick jam. And how did they attach things to the house? Now, the house had old growth lumber, really beautiful timbers, real two by floor lumber, uh, floor framing rather, and then cross bracing. And you can see the original floors were nailed right to the joist. There was no subfloor, there was no intermediate floor. And then when they added windows and doors, they actually let in a piece of that old growth lumber right into the masonry. And you know, you would think that over the course of what, 100 plus years when I got to this house, I think we started this remodel maybe 2014, 2015. So this was a well over 100 year old house. That lumber embedded in the masonry, you'd be worried that that would see a bunch of rot or decay, but I didn't see any. Very, very impressive. I did see a few areas, however, that termites had gotten to the house. Here in the south, termites are a big deal for us. And this is one section of some pine flooring, probably some longleaf pine that just had a little bit of uh, termite damage. But for the most part, the house is in incredible shape. We did a full house remodel uh, and the house was brought back to its, its former glory and even better. Okay, now let's fast forward a couple decades. This is a 1930s house. And this house, instead of being masonry, this is a true wood house. It had wood siding. Uh, again, it hadn't really been touched, which was beautiful for me, so I could really dissect it. And as you can see here, wood siding on the outside. On the inside, I've actually showed this photo before. This was kind of a, uh, a cool photo. When the house was built, there was no heating and cooling system in the house originally. And probably around the 1950s, window units were added for air conditioning. Again, we're, we're down here in Texas, so it's super hot. And I love this photo because this photo, probably taken in the 70s or 80s, you can see the wallpaper had a ton of staining. These windows, every time it rained, probably had some serious leakage going on. And I assumed when I was gonna take this house apart that I would probably find some rot and some damage. Now here's uh, one of the rooms in the house, one of the bedrooms. We took off the drywall that was added on the probably uh, 1980s, maybe 1990s. And now you can really see how the house was built. Uh, this is true shiplap. This is not Chip and Joanna shiplap. This is real one by shiplap, solid pine. This was found on both the inside and the outside. So the two by fours were sheathed on both sides with shiplap. And then later on that drywall was hung. And you know what, on the back of the drywall, I thought we might find some mold growth from all that water that was uh, leaking in, none. You'll also notice that at some point, someone had tried to add some insulation uh, to these walls, but for the most part, almost all the cavities were empty. Uh, 
So there was probably plenty of airflow through these cavities. The, the walls got wet when it rained, but they were able to dry out and really no issues, uh, except for a couple of places, as I mentioned on the other house, that had a little bit of termite damage, but not very much. Now, that house built in the 30s probably had lumber like this. I love this photo. I found this uh, from a guy that I follow on Instagram who's a remodeler, uh, Detmore 101. Look at this picture of old growth versus new growth lumber. So that old growth lumber, look at all the growth rings on that photo. And the new growth, very few rings. This really brings out a first massive difference between old houses and new houses. Old houses, old growth lumber, they had a lot of ability to soak up moisture. They had a lot of ability to um, be structural. And, um, uh, and that old lumber just was a much higher quality than new lumber. Okay, moving on. Oh, by the way, here's, here's what the house looked like when we finished the remodel. Uh, I love how the architect, Hugh Jefferson Randolph, uh, kept the very old school look at the front, but added on to the back in a very modern way. Okay, another house. We're fast forwarding a few more decades now. This is a house built in the 1960s here in Austin. And the first thing you notice on this house is giant overhangs. Uh, the last house that we looked at, that wood framed house, one or two foot overhangs, this house had like five foot overhangs. Brick facade, and whenever I see a house built in the 70s, 80s with brick facades, I'm worried. I'm worried that that brick soaked up a lot of moisture when it rained or if the sprinkler systems hit the brick and what kind of rot or mold or issues am I gonna find behind the brick? But guess what? Those massive overhangs, those five foot overhangs meant that when we took some sections of brick down to check it out, look at this. It was in pristine condition back there. Now this house had an interesting type of sheathing that wasn't used for a whole long, a long time in America. This is a gypsum sheathing that had an asphalt impregnated face, basically a tar paper face. And again, because of that overhang, nothing was getting wet back there. That brick never got wet. And even though um, we have a, a material that's not one that I would certainly use today, it had, because it wasn't getting wet, it was in terrific shape. I found really no problems on this house. And here's the inside of the house after we stripped it down uh, to remodel it. Very few problems inside, but a couple of termite issues just in a few um, very uh, specific places, not, not widespread by any means. Now, why did that house in particular do so well? Let's take a quick two second timeout for some building science here. This was a study by Building Science Corporation um, from Canada where they looked at old houses uh, and remodeled houses and percentage of houses that had problems. Look at that red column on the left. Houses with no overhang, they found a lot of problems. Houses with a bigger overhang, over 24 inches, not that many problems. So the first takeaway from this, I think, is that overhangs from those old houses made a massive difference in um, making those old houses last. Those old houses also, as you saw, had some great materials between old growth lumber or super thick stone walls. That's some materials that we may or may not be able to get today. They also were materials that weren't particularly moisture sensitive, right? You know, drywall or newer growth lumber or OSB plywood, much more moisture sensitive. Those older growth materials, not as sensitive. The other thing about those older houses, in particular the you know, 1880s or 1930s house that I showed a minute ago, when they were built, there was no air conditioning. They had heating, of course, to keep people uh, from dying in the wintertime, but there was no air conditioning back then. And as a result, there was no cold surfaces for condensation to happen. Remember last week's video, we talked about airflow and what happens when air leaks into a house with air conditioning. A lot of bad things happen. Those houses avoided that by not having air conditioning. Also, those old houses, they were energy pigs. You know, they had lots of airflow. Um, they didn't have hardly any or no insulation, which meant that in the wintertime, if it got cold out, they had massive heating bills. It was super hard to keep those things warm. And when they did finally air condition them, they probably had a heck of a time keeping the air conditioning going. They need massive air conditioning to cool them down. They were massive energy users. And again, lots and lots of airflow. That was a good thing. Remember that 1930s house with those stains under the window? That house dried out because it had lots of airflow and that was a good thing for that old house. The last thing I want to mention on these old houses too is that um, for many, many decades as Americans, we had pretty low standards when it came to comfort. You know, the people that lived in those older houses, 
They didn't go to their thermostat and set it down to 72 every night before they went to bed. They lived with whatever the conditions were. And maybe in the wintertime they added some heat, but they probably put a sweater on. And in the summertime when it was hot, they sure didn't sleep with a duvet cover over them and, uh, and snuggled up tight under the covers because the house was cold. No, they, uh, they probably slept on top of the covers and they sweated. And maybe as, uh, as they were able to, they added a fan or a window rattler in one room so they could cool down at night. But they sure didn't have the comfort standards of today. So now let's talk about newer houses. And again, let's take a two minute timeout for building science here. I love this definition of building science. If you watch my channel, you know I talk about this a lot. Uh, I've gotten an education in building science and my hope is this channel is gonna help educate you. And that's what we're talking about today. The practical purpose of building science is to provide predictive capability to optimize building performance of new and existing buildings, to understand and prevent building failures, and to guide the design of new techniques and technologies. I love that definition. Okay, next, before I show you a couple newer houses, let's talk about the layers of the house, right? So there's, there's really uh, something on the outside of the house that we refer to as the building envelope, but the envelope is comprised of three parts. We've got the protection layer, the control layer, and the structure. Now in the stone house, the structure was the stone but we really didn't have the control and protect layer. Everything was stone. On the wooden house, the structure was the wood. It didn't really have much of a control layer on the outside. It really just had a paint film, right? Now we fast forward to the 60s house and we saw the structure was wood. It had some gypsum sheathing out there. There was insulation in the cavities and the protection layer was the brick. There's four things that a house has to control, right? It has to control water, it has to control air, that's to control vapor. And then lastly, thermal, that's the, uh, the temperature change or the insulation layer on the house. Those old houses did a pretty incredible job of controlling those first three things without having failures, but at what price? So as we look now at some newer houses, let's keep all those things in mind. So this house is one of the first houses um, uh, that I put EFIS on. EIFS, exter external or exterior insulated finishing system. If you're an old builder, you know what I'm talking about. If you're a young builder, you probably never heard of this. This picture was taken in 2001. This was really uh, a pivotal time in America and a pivotal time in my career because this is when I first learned about building science. Um, this house you can see framed pretty traditionally and had uh, plywood sheathing on the outside. And then this EFIS system, this was a relatively new system in the marketplace that came out in the late 90s, around the year 2000. It was a, a sheet of foam that you would glue the back of the foam um, with the glue and stick it right onto the sheathing. And then on top of that, you would put a synthetic stucco, basically a troweled on one coat stucco on the outside. It would come out of a five gallon bucket. It was like a latex coat of paint stucco combined. And then you would caulk in all the windows and you'd leave it. The problem with the system was that you had to have a perfectly sealed exterior or moisture would get in. And what happens when moisture gets into a house that doesn't have airflow, that's not made out of solid stone walls, or doesn't have um, the ability to dry? Here's a perfect example of that. This house, tons of rot, and literally these photos were taken just a hair over a year after the house was built. Um, the water was getting in. And it's a little hard to tell in this photo, but probably the water was coming in from these upper windows right here where we had just a, a little break in the caulking. Some water was getting back in there. It had no place to dry. There was no airflow. Even though we had relatively good materials, you know, some really good plywood, that plywood could never dry. And you've heard me say before, my friend David Nicastro, if it can't dry, it's going to die. That's exactly what happened here. Tons of rot because the system wasn't allowed to dry. And what does this mean for us today? It means that when we've got more sensitive materials like we are building with today, we need to control the rain. We need to control the water. Let's look at another house. This is a house that I remodeled. This was just a hair over 10 years old when I got there. Fairly typical uh, Texas house. And uh, I actually shot a video of the base of the wall. Now you saw this is a stone house, but this is unlike the first stone house that was solid stone. This is a stone veneer, just like a brick front on a house is a stone front. There's a stone ledge like you, you can see in the photo here. 
the house had a sheet applied um, uh, WRB, weather resistant barrier. It had this black uh, kind of paper flashing that was meant to kick it out. And you can see now that this, this OSB, which is a more sensitive material, it's not like a solid wood, um, when exposed to water, especially at the base of the house, because you even on a house with overhangs, on a two-story house, you get a lot of water at the base of a house. Look how this paper-based flashing fare. It's common detail you see in houses. This black stuff you see get put on. Ooh, this stuff is about good. six years old in this house. And you can how see that, that there is some black stuff happening on the OSB. And I don't have a picture of it here, but um, if you put your knife into it, it wasn't mushy, but clearly it had degraded that OSB had in only 10 years. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at the inside of that house now. Now on the inside of the house, we had a vapor control layer. That's that plastic layer. That's a big no-no in Texas. In Texas, we do not want any vapor control on the inside. That's a northern detail. We only want to control vapor at the outside wall. And we had a few places where sprinklers were hitting the house and getting things real wet. And as a result, here's what we found on the back of the sheetrock in several places. Now, am I saying that every house built in the last 10 years has this issue? No, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that we have a much more sensitive materials that we're building with today when we build with sheetrock and we build with OSB and newer growth lumber. Let's look at another one. This is another one I remodeled. This is, these photos are from about 10 years ago. And at the time, this house was also about 10 years old. Again, a fairly uh, Texas, uh, Tuscan looking house. And if you look right to the right of the front door, look at that black staining happening there uh, on the stone. Remember that in your mind. We're going to look at this picture after we've taken the uh, skin off this building. So here's us doing the remodeling. We were changing the front facade and changing the things around. But you're starting to see what we're getting into here. Look at that OSB. You can see that it's dark colored and discolored in a bunch of areas. On this photo here, look at the very left. You see that green staining on the, uh, on the brick? Anytime you see green or black staining on a brick or, or a, uh, pardon me, a stone front like this, you should always be thinking, what's behind there? If that is green, it means it's getting wet. And this is a porous material, brick and stone absorb, and the mortar really absorbs. What's happening behind there? Well, this house had one layer of uh, tar paper as the protection. There was also a white uh, sheet applied WRB, but it was getting wet. We had some areas where the gutters weren't working properly and we had splashback. We also had some areas where the landscape um, sprinkler heads were hitting the house on a pretty regular basis. And that was absorbing a lot of water. And what happens when uh, that absorbs a lot of water? And again, you've got sensitive materials. It's not good, people. We need to be really cautious about that. And this is on the front porch where we actually had a pretty decent overhang in this area. But again, a sensitive material. Look at that OSB after 10 years of, of getting wet. Now this wasn't uh, soaking wet, but it was getting enough moisture that we even saw a little bit of uh, fungal growth on there, that white stuff. Uh, not good, not good. And more of that same happening over on the other side of the house. So let's fast forward a little bit. We talked about the materials, we talked about the overhangs, we talked about older houses being energy pigs. Let's talk about those comfort standards and can we build today like we built in the old days? You probably could if you were building a cabin in the woods that you knew you were only going to occupy a certain amount of the time. But if you're building a house that you care about the energy bill or you care about comfort, I'm not sure that we can build like we did in the old days. You know, here's a 1970s car. This is from my, uh, you know, my generation. I grew up in the 70s and the 80s. Would that car today be, still be sold in the lot? No, it wouldn't. Think about today's cars and today's standards. Much, much higher standard for every measure of performance, whether it's comfort, whether it's energy efficiency, whether it's, uh, gosh, almost anything when it comes to the car. Those two cars, they both have four wheels and a steering wheel and an engine, but they are vastly different machines, vastly different materials being used. And that's the same with today's houses. Okay, let me fast forward now to... Um, to give you a, uh, an overview or a perspective that maybe you hadn't thought of before. If you've seen this house before, I call this our perfect wall house. This is a concept designed by Building Science Corporation and uh, a really smart building scientist, Joe Stebrick. 
This is a house that utilizes new materials, but puts them together in a way that's a little bit different. So let's run through this house. This house framed traditionally, you know, regular two buys, new, new growth lumber. Now we did sheathe it on the outside in kind of an old school way, but you'll see, you'll see in a minute why, because the inside of the house was gonna be left exposed. And as you see this finished photo, you think, where's the insulation there? Check out my other video, I'll put a link in the description on a tour of this house. But where's the insulation? The insulation is going to go on the outside of the house rather than the inside of the house. So now let's look at the exterior. Here's the outside framing. We sheathed the house um, pretty traditionally with wood. We built it with wood. But then what did we do? Instead of a uh, weather resistive barrier or something that was only relatively waterproof like tar paper or a sheet applied uh, product that, that uh, gets staples through it, we put a really bomber waterproofing on this house. We used basically an ice and water shield on the outside of the house. You see me do this all the time on my houses today when I use that silver waterproofing made by Polywall called Alumaflash. But this is the very first time I'd ever uh, thought about it and, and had done a really um, very waterproof exterior. You also notice this house doesn't have any overhangs. And I mentioned earlier that overhangs are good for houses. That's true. But let me show you why we didn't. On this house, we were able to run the waterproofing from the foundation up and over the ridge of the house and all the way back down. So that it was done, it looked like a big Monopoly piece. And it was able to be wrapped uh, top to bottom with this super thick, gooey waterproofing peel and stick. And then on top of that, we added the insulation. Now we used two layers of insulation on the outside of the house. And why do we do that? Why would we wrap that insulation on the outside of the house? Well, now that insulation is just doing thermal control duties for us. Behind that is the control layer that's controlling water and air and vapor all in one. That peel and stick is gonna do an incredible job of controlling the water, controlling the air, and controlling the vapor. The insulation is just doing thermal duties. And then we ran a, a one by four batten on that and attached siding to that. Um, so here now you can see this is the, the uh, gable end. That insulation is all the way over the house like a big blanket of insulation. No bridging, no issues with, uh, with studs causing thermal bridging. Everything is thoroughly blanketed. The only holes in that were the windows and doors. And here's the finished house. As a result, we didn't hang drywall on the inside because um, we wanted to kind of showcase uh, what we could do, but you could hang drywall in this house. You could you could build this very traditionally on the inside if you wanted to. You could even put lath and plaster in there. Guys, I hope today's uh, episode gave you a little bit of a uh, taste and a desire to learn more about building science. But what's the big takeaways on this? Our old house is built better. In some respects, they were built a little better. We had some better materials back then. But in other respects, they weren't built to today's standards. I don't think any one of you would go back and live in that 1880s house with your family or that 1930s house as the way it was built in the 1930s. We can't go back there when it comes to materials, air conditioning, energy pigs, airflow or low standards. We can add overhangs, but everything else is changed. And so we need to think of the house from a building science perspective. We need to think about how we put our houses together. We need to do the best possible job we can when it comes to waterproofing and keeping the air out of our houses. And then once we do those things right, then we can worry about vapor control and insulation. Those things are low down the list when it comes to importance. Guys, I appreciate you hanging with me today. Let me wrap up today's episode with, uh, with a little quote from The Elements of Building, one of my favorite books that I come back to all the time. I, uh, I have so many pages underlined in here because I love this book. But, uh, but I love this quote about quality. What is quality? Quality is great excellence. Quality, like honesty, is not optional. Nearly everyone knows the difference between a mediocre and a quality product. The best employees will want to produce it, and the best customers will pay for it. Selling quality instead of price will bring more interesting and more profitable jobs. Guys, thanks for following me on The Build Show. For more information on this topic, Check out the uh, links that I'll have in the description below. A couple other videos that I think will give you more info on this topic. Otherwise, follow me on Twitter or Instagram. We'll see you next time on The Build Show.